friends uh, welcome back the following hour uh, we will be reflecting on uh, the crisis uh, in in india's countryside whenever we these days have any discussion about india's agrarian crisis uh, the metaphor is always summoned of uh, the farmer committing suicide and i fear that the enormity of that continuing tragedy gets lost as sometimes happens when uh, when a tragedy is metamorphosized into a cliche but the fact that thousands of our farmers in despair i sometimes think of it that we've had many epidemics that have plagued in india's countryside but this is an unending epidemic of despair and what is the source of that despair and what can be how it can be addressed uh, would be some of the issues that we would be talking about as you would recall in the morning many speakers uh, prabhat and others and through the morning in fact in different contexts pe- people talked about how little uh, public spending was being done in agriculture for a sector which employs almost two thirds of our people contributes just one sixth of the our gdp and gets about 5% of public spending but also the reality that every single day about the, an estimated 3 to 4000 people for the last 10 years have been leaving agriculture forever it's almost like it looks like a dying civilization in many ways there is the unsustainability of our agricultural practices uh, there is the poisoning of the aquifers uh, and of soil there is the very unequal engagement of farmers with the international uh, economy there are the whole questions of 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 the absence of state support uh, to the farmer these are all matters uh, that are out before us and within that we would be trying to focus on uh, it's not a problem certainly created by the present government it's a problem that has been inherited but what has this government actually set out to do or not do Uh, would be a, a preoccupation uh, but utsa would be uh, uh, you know she's been studying these issues and most of us have read and learned uh, from her work for, for a long time she would be taking a larger context and i think a larger sweep of of, of understanding the agrarian crisis and viju would focus more clearly on uh, what this government had actually put down on its manifesto and what it actually has tried to do thank you as the marxist uh, economist paul baran had said long ago uh, what is cooked in the kitchen is not decided in the kitchen so what happens in agriculture is actually decided outside agriculture for a decade and a half now ever since neoliberal economic policies started to be implemented in our country from 1991 onwards i have been pointing out that the core of neoliberal policies consists in two main elements there are many other subsidiary elements but there are two core elements one is fiscal contraction that is a policy of income deflation which makes no sense at all there is no theoretical justification for it it is something that international finance demands and which pliant governments in third world countries like ours have increasingly succumbed to as a kind of policy mantra and the second is free trade and both have been extremely adverse as far as the situation of the peasantry and the working class is concerned now i find a kind of political cycle that is regardless of what the complexion is of the government which comes to power public expenditures are cut down sharply and more and more measures are taken to open up agriculture in particular to free trade that is to meet the demands of the global market rather than domestic demands and the present government has been no exception i think you have already learned in the morning about the very large cuts and rather unexpected because it came to power uh, we didn't expect we expected the cuts but not for them to be so large because the government came to power uh, on the back of not only urban discontent but also peasant discontent but there have been extremely large cuts announced in the budget in development expenditures whereas uh, excluding the food subsidy the share of social sector expenditure was 2 and 1/2% of gdp in 2010 11 
The budget estimates for 2015-16 put it at only 1.7%. Already it was abysmally low, it has been cut further. These are only budget estimates. The revised estimates will be lower and the actuals will be even lower than this. Now the government will of course say that where have we cut expenditures? The 14th Finance Commission has already raised by 10 percentage points to a, a very high 42% the devolution of the divisible central tax uh, incomes to the states. So we are giving 140,000 crores more to the states. So where are the cuts? This is the argument they'll give. So it's uh, important to be clear about the trickery involved there because uh, at the same time that 140,000 crores of rupees more have been are going to the states ostensibly, the plan assistance to the states, if you look at the small print, has been cut by 135,000 crores, by almost the same amount. So the Modi government has taken away almost exactly the same amount as the 14th uh, Finance Commission has given to the states. And on top of that, it has gone in for reducing rural development expenditures and social sector expenditures very, very drastically. Every time it has been carried out, the rate of unemployment growth has shot up, or if you want to put it the other way, the employment growth rate has come down drastically, because this basically involves income deflation. For every 100 rupees less that the government spends in development and in other expenditures, there is at least a 500 rupee contraction of income in people's hands. This is the working of the Keynesian multiplied in reverse. Okay, so it really means that people su suffer, the working class and the peasantry suffer from higher unemployment and there is general squeeze on the purchasing, mass purchasing power within the nation, whereas of course a very tiny minority, I would say not more than 5 to 7 percent of the population, is given enormous tax benefits and other kinds of subsidies. So their income is growing up, going up very, very fast. Now, I'll just give you some figures of the transfer of resources to the states as percentage of GDP. Maybe people have given you these figures already. By 2014-15, that is the revised estimates, it has come down to 4.8%. The budget estimates to, for 2015-16 say it's going to go up to 52 So actually, it's going to come down to about 4.2%. Uh, this is a prediction. Let's see how it works out. That's what I'm saying for the fiscal 2015-16. Please note that number and see how it works out in a few months. Which is a very sad, sad situation uh, for the country to be in. In other words, the Modi government has been continuing with exactly the same income deflating neoliberal policies that previous governments uh, had, and that is why Mr. Montek Singh Aliwalia, when uh, he was talking to Joseph Stiglitz, and this is from the horse's mouth, from Joseph Stiglitz, Stiglitz was very shocked to hear Montek Singh Aliwalia telling him that Modi is following the right policy. But there's nothing to be surprised at that. Uh, Mr. Mono, uh, Aliwalia, along with Mr. Chidambaram and our former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, were the architects of this kind of fiscal contractionism. So obviously he's very happy with this policy being continued by the Modi government. Now, um, if we look at uh, India's position in the world economy, which not many people look at, so I'll give you a few figures on that. The world average uh, uh, supply and demand per capita is 337 kilos in the year 2011. The United States consumes, absorbs in all forms, 1,033 kilos. That's like three times the world average. Of course, it consumes only about 106 kilos directly as bread and so on. It consumes 500 kilos indirectly as animal products which are fed grain as feed grains. It has the highest level of consumption in the entire world. What is our position? Our position is in 2011, the average Indian consumes 176.5 compared to 1,033 for the average American. And in this context, you can see how absurd is the argument put forward by some advanced country economists that with diversification of diets, there's nothing to worry about if Indians are consuming less 
because they're consuming more of other things. If they're consuming more of other things, they should show up in a rise in this figure. But we have the lowest in the world. And what is shocking is that this figure I'm quoting to you from the FAO database, 176.5 kilos per annum, is lower than the average for the least developed countries. We are worse off than Nepal and Bhutan and uh, uh, some of the Af sub-Saharan African countries, which comprise the least developed countries. Because their average consumption was 210.2 kilos compared to our 176.5. So they're way above. They're like, you know, 33 kilos, no, more than that, um, 34, 34 kilos more than us on average. The average for Africa is even higher, 225.7, which is about 50 kilos higher than our consumption. So why are we in this abysmally poor situation? Now, we are all well fed. You can look at me, I, can look, I see you. You look all very well fed to me. So obviously we belong to the top 5% of the population which is not only well fed, which is improving its consumption. We are probably the people who go to all the new eateries which are coming up, you know, all over the place. But the fact of the matter is that our average has been going down. And that means that for 80%, at least 75 to 80% of the population, it has been going down faster than the average has been going down since our consumption has been going up. Now, there's a joke I have quoted many times, but I still continue to quote that, which is that Adam Smith, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations 200 years ago, said that, look, there's a natural upper bound to the amount of food a man can consume, which is given by the size of his stomach. Now, the average American stomach is not six times larger than the average Indian stomach. But the average American is still absorbing six times more per capita food grains than the average Indian is. What is the explanation for that? As I've already explained, it is because such a high proportion, there are such a, there's such a high level of animal product consumption, not only milk, but meat, uh, especially beef, which is very expensive to produce in terms of grain, feed grain, in that country that they managed to consume, despite having the same physical stomach size, they managed to consume six times more than a developing country population like ours manages to consume. So we are in a very, very bad position, in a really shocking position. And most people are not even aware of it because they don't look at the international data. They don't make these inter We are worse off than sub-Saharan Africa. We are worse off than the average for the whole of Africa, which includes the relatively more prosperous uh, countries in Northern Africa, which includes the Republic of South Africa. We are worse off than the least developed countries. Even. So what explains this? Now, the reason I've been giving, the argument I've been putting forward for a long time now, but I don't think many people have been listening, is that, um, uh, you know, essentially, the purchasing power of the mass of our population is getting periodically very strongly squeezed by these contractionary neoliberal policies that I've been outlining. And the free trade policies have produced, of course, actual situation of crisis in the case of cash crops producers because it has exposed them to very high levels of price volatility. They've been exposed to global prices in a way that they were not exposed before. And as a result of this compression of purchasing power, what we find is that periodically, uh, even though in the past, not in the last four years, but before that, the per capita output growth has been falling in this country. The per capita food grain demand has been falling even faster. So that we have had episodes of building up of unsold stocks. And this has followed a cycle. When a new government come, came in, comes in, and initiates these deflationary policies, by the way, it doesn't continue with these policies for longer than about three years. Because at the end of three years, they suddenly wake up to the fact that the general elections are around the corner, just another 18 months or two years from now. And we have to do something to make ourselves popular with the people. So they let up. Then they let up on their contractionary policies. They try to do something positive, And then they trade on that in order to uh, get elected. So I find a very interesting, I haven't put it in any paper yet. I'm trying to find correlations between the contractionary policies and the first three years of new governments. But it is something I observe. 
that uh, in the early 90s, when there was very sharp contractionary measures followed, you had the first episode of building up of stocks. The second episode came with the NDA government coming to power. From 1998 onwards, right up to 2001, and of course, this was also contributed to by targeting of the public, another disaster, targeting of the PDS. Earlier, we had a universal PDS. Everyone has a, had a ration card. I had a ration card. Then with targeting uh, into the very artificial division between above poverty line and below poverty line, using a totally arbitrary notion of the poverty line, millions of actually poor people were targeted out from the public distribution system from the fair price shops from 1997 onwards. In fact, if you compare uh, 1997 to 2001, you find that the food rates distributed through the fair price shops practically halved just in those five years because of this targeting out of the actually poor who were denied BPL ration cards. So uh, the second episode of build up of huge stocks came uh, from 1998 onwards until by 2002, the annual excess stocks were 64 and a half million tons of food grains, unsold food grains. <coughs> what was the analysis given by our leading economists and by the government? We are producing too much. So what has the government been doing about it? It has been exporting. Just as the NDA government did in 2002-03, over those two years, the India government exported 22 million tons of food trains while domestic hunger was growing. In the last three years, ending in fiscal 2014, India has exported 52 million tons of food trains. And where are these exports coming out of? It is coming out of more and more empty stocks. As more and more people go hungry, stocks build up, their purchasing power is curtailed. But that is not the our government and the new liberals will never learn from experience. They still continue with the wrong theories. So that is why I said to you that it's very important to understand that what is happening in our agriculture is the result of policies which have been followed at the macroeconomic level. Well, I've been saying this for so long, but uh, I haven't found anybody else talking about this. Uh, I hope Vijay Krishnan is going to talk about the uh, actual results on the ground of these totally disastrous policies which have been followed. And of course, even this year, there are no limitations on exports because we still have very large stocks, unsold stocks. And there is absolutely not a glimmering of hope, even with the new Food Security Act, that we are going to be able to reverse the situation of decline. Because you can have passed any number of acts as long as you have targeting, and as long as you continue to produce, uh, follow these kinds of income deflating policies which curtail mass purchasing power, people are not going to be able to lift the food. So I think these policies need to be reversed. I would have had a lot to say, but uh, we have a limited time, so I'll hand over to you, Krishna. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for laying, laying out the broad framework of the crisis in Indian agriculture. Uh, Viju would focus more, more specifically on what government policies yes. promised to do and did, did or did not do in the past year. The last uh, one year of the BJP-led NDA government is, uh, and their policies in agriculture is being evaluated today. How it has further <coughs> accentuated the agrarian distress in our countryside. If one were to look into the speeches of, the, of Narendra Modi before the elections, it would look as though it is lifting directly out of a charter of demands of the All India Kisan Sabha. Mm -hmm. But for land reforms, it speaks about almost every one of the demands that the Kisan Sabha and organizations like ours has been making. Over the last one year, the government's own assessment is there has been an increase in the rate of farmers' suicides. Secondly, it spoke about, and this was one of the uh, most important points raised by Narendra Modi in his election speeches, that farmers would be given a minimum support price 
as recommended by the Swaminathan Commission, where at least 50% over and above the cost of production would be given to the farmers as the minimum support. Immediately after coming to power, one of the first betrayals was on this count. Almost within a month or so after the government came to power, the minimum support price were announced and but for wheat and paddy where a, mi a very minuscule increase of about 50 rupees per quintal was made, for most other crops it was kept as it was a year ago. There was no um, increase in the cost of production seen by the government. We met the agriculture minister and he said during elections lot of things are spoken and lot of it, to get votes we all speak you also sp uh, speak and it is you should see uh, mr modi's promises only in that light he very clearly mentioned that and he said there cannot be any increase in minimum support price and when an organization went to the court saying that the government had promised a minimum support price of cost of production plus 50% the government filed an affidavit saying it was impossible to pay such a minimum support price. That is one of the first betrayals. Secondly, they mentioned about an increase in public investment in agriculture and rural development. Already it has been discussed here. We also see the cuts on the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act and how almost just after coming to power, initially there were attacks on the rights of the working class. Next, they hit out at the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which provided some little succor to the rural poor who would get at least 100 days of employment, though they were not actually getting them. So they have now said that out of the 6,576 blocks, you have to curtail it down to 2,500 blocks. For example, one of the best performing states is Tripura on MNREG. And their uh, demand was something like 1,200 crores. And what the government allocated was exactly 50% of that. If you take the example of fertilizers, diammonium phosphate, about $500 per ton is the rate at which our big companies, Tata, Birla, Ambani's, they are importing from China and Morocco and about $230 is the subsidy per ton given by the government of India, but there is no price control. The companies decide the farm gate prices, so the farmers end up paying as high as $600 per ton. This was something which we had raised continuously, nothing has been done on that. Another in the manifesto was that farm insurance scheme to take care of crop loss due to natural calamities and to strengthen and expand rural credit facilities. I have just returned after a two day visit to the areas in Haryana where farmers have committed suicide. This is in the state which has been showcased as the area where India had uh, the green revolution, the states which have fed our country. That is the situation there. A lot of farmers have committed suicide. Many of them have just died of shock. Heart attack has been a reason. This is not, there is absolutely no compensation. The government is talking about the highest compensation being paid. This is what Modi, uh, he said about 12,000 rupees per acre. We find the land, one acre of land is leased at around 46,000 rupees. And this 12,000 is not given to each and every person who has lost his crop. And when the unseasonal rains to, uh, happened, the government initially mentioned that around 2 crore hectares of land across the country were affected and crops had uh, been destroyed. Overnight, that was cut down by 75 lakh hectares, saying that the states were uh, exaggerating to uh, get compensation for, uh, for the farms. 
that is how this government has been uh, functioning. Another point they had mentioned was about a national land use policy for scientific acquisition of non-cultivable land for development and a national as well as state land use authority. We all know what has happened as far as the land acquisition uh, or, uh, act is concerned and how it has been amended to remove the principles of prior informed consent as well as social impact assessment and how on both sides of exp the expressway up to one kilometer of land could be acquired in the name of development. Despite widespread protests, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented reaction and unprecedented issue-based unity built against this, the government is hell-bent on pushing this uh, particular land acquisition ordinance which would actually facilitate corporate land grab. It also mentioned about protecting the interests of farmers and keeping in mind food security goals of the country. That the little protection which the earlier act had mentioned for food security, though we were, we were not totally happy with all the provisions in the act, even that protection for food security has been done away with this particular act. The manifesto also speaks about welfare measure for farmers above 60 years, small and marginal farmers and farm labor. This is nothing, uh, no steps in this direction has taken place. Expansion of irrigation facilities, it is so in the budget, very uh, minuscule allo allocations uh, be, uh, being done which would amount to less than a few crores per district. That is the kind of allocation that has been made and they also did talk about a price stabilization fund in in effect after they have come they have further accelerated the pace of trade liberalization they are going in for much more mega free trade agreements which would ensure a lot of dumping of cheap agricultural products into our country we all know they were one of in the forefront before the elections to oppose the FDI in retail, but now they are also talking in terms of FDI in retail. So this is the kind of betrayals that has been happening. The Prime Minister has been making a lot of talk about how his own good fortune is going to bring good fortune for the country and the farmers, but the situation is quite uh, pathetic in the countryside. The peasantry are organizing against us. There are, yes, there are suicides, but we would like to note the unity that could be built on the, against the land acquisition ordinance. They have had to go in for a joint parliamentary committee. On the issue of the agrarian crisis, different political parties have been taking their, uh, making their questions, especially in the context of the suicide of Gajendra Singh at uh, the Aam Admi Party rally here. There are people claiming to be Kisan friendly. There are people who claim that they are the true sons of the soil, farmer friendly, budgets are being spoken about, but none of them are hitting at what actually is leading to this distress. That is what Professor uh, Utsa mentioned here. The neoliberal policies are the crux of this agrarian distress that we are facing. And they are all just talking about how their budgets are farmer friendly, how they are giving more compensation to the farming community and so on. They are not hitting at this important aspect that it is the neoliberal economic policies which have brought the situation to such a pass. The BJP has been accelerating these policies and in effect, they are in one of their documents when the Edurapa government was in the uh, Edurapa was ruling Karnataka. They came with a document, Integrated Agri Business Development Plan, and it mentions in the document, with, without any hesitation, it has mentioned how they would promote agri tourism, and it says up to 2,000 hectares could be taken, and what would be the agri tourism that would happen there? There would be bullock cart riding and feeding of cows and goats 
so you could have people from abroad coming and uh, looking at our uh, farmers in these as some museum pieces they wrote it in their document that is what this government um, narendra modi's government wants to do it is a, a following a policy of deliberate popularizing deliberately pushing the peasantry <coughs> into distress and they want cheap labor for their grand plan of make in india and they also have another suggestion for the food security that you should shop for land abroad so the, uh, you could also have this uh, dispossessed peasantry who would go as cheap labor to work in this land abroad they are talking about a ppp for in integrated agricultural development public private partnership for integrated agriculture development the different companies including tata chemicals are now coming into agriculture to produce uh, biofuels and different such things so this is the direction in which this country uh, as far as the bjp led government is concerned they are trying to lead this country it is required that the broadest possible unity is built we may have certain differences on uh, political issues but on this question affecting the peasantry there is need for building the broadest possible unity and it is not a struggle that the all india kisan sabha or a single uh, political party alone can win i hope that this particular discussion would lead to some such kind of a unity emerging thank you thanks viju uh, i think we've had to very admirable uh, wide sweeping reflections on uh, on on an extremely uh, complex subject we have learned from utsa how uh, new liberal deflationary policies have hit per capita food consumption in our country uh, making them among the lowest and it's something that she's been talking about for a long time but which just is not uh, catching uh, attention and how uh the rising food stocks are further hit by uh, targeting of the public distribution system whereas from viju we've learned many things we've learned you know uh, the fact that the manifesto contained so many promises reflects the fact that it's not that people don't understand what the solutions to the problem uh, it's a very conscious decision not to address those solutions which makes it far more culpable and so issues like the msp guarantee something that the farmers commission and uh, uh, ms swaminathan has been speaking about a guarantee that every farmer will get the cost of uh, minimum support price guarantee for every crop at the cost of production plus 50% in fact uh, you know we've been feeling that that should be translated into a legal right of every farmer as a form of uh, production but actually we found that msp in fact the incentives to the states for msp procurement have actually gone down higher much higher public investment is required the protection of nreg nreg a cheaper agricultural inputs farm insurance farmers income protection price stabilization policies uh, a rational scientific land use policy add at the end also the concerns of farm workers who are pushed into uh, distress migration uh, yon bremen who who writes about them uses a very evocative term he says that a large segment of our workforce in the countryside are reduced to what he calls hunters and gatherers of work basically uh, we have large segments of our people who go for any kind of work in any on any terms in any corner of the country just to survive and therefore you know where i was just traveling in Uh, remote parts of arunachal and i found workers from bihar and jharkhand young boys hardly 16 17 have landed up somewhere trying to earn a living some some kind of way so this overall crisis uh, in indian agriculture and a government which is very little committed to uh, to addressing or reversing any of these is the context i won't uh, add anything more the one question about bonded labor i think uh, needed addressing and as a reminder of the very bottom end of the agrarian crisis the nature of debt bondage uh, that i have seen has changed uh, in recent times you know from intergenerational kind of bondage what you're seeing now is is that bondage continues but it's it's a annual kind of bondage and it's even worse because actually that sense of responsibility that you had in intergenerational 
uh, you know, that to keep the person alive, even that is not there. I sell myself for a year against a loan. Uh, somebody buys me, I'm become a slave for a year, and then I'm bought with my loan for the next year. So we are seeing the worst of capitalism and feudalism playing in uh, on the fate of, of bonded workers. And I think that image, along with the farmer suicide, needs to remain with us uh, as we move forward. Thank you.